Hi, I'm Paul Macklin. I'm an Associate Professor of Intelligence Systems Engineering at Indiana University and uh, the Founder and Lead of the Physicel Project. I'm really happy to welcome you to the, uh, to the Workshop 2021 and to start with session zero, because all programming starts at zero. We're going to introduce the concept of agent-based modeling, some of the motivation behind it, and then introduce uh, how Physicel fits into that bigger picture. So the concepts we'll be going over here today, again, is to talk about the, the motivation for and concepts of agent-based modeling to briefly survey the, uh, the types of agent-based modeling approaches that are out there, learn about Physicel's main uh, approaches, and then start to see some examples using Physicel. So really our goal here as scientists, and what motivates us is that simple single cell behaviors, things like cell growth and division, death, adhesion, pushing each other around with mechanics, motility, uh, secreting chemical factors, and then consuming them or uptaking and sensing them, uh, sampling the microenvironment, uh, chasing each other around and eating them, uh, eating other cells in predation, or even just changing cell types and differentiation processes. You know, really a handful of simple individual behaviors, but when you put these things together with many cells interacting, you get complex behaviors, you get differentiation, you get formation of networks and complex morphologies, you get cell ecologies that pop up in microbial systems, you get uh, formation of organs and specialized structures. And so really a big question we ask ourselves as scientists is how do these systems self-organize and sustain themselves and maintain a functioning tissue? And of course, in cancer and diseases, we wonder about how these processes break down or get abused to lead to diseases. And really, you know, biology is a multi-scale uh, complex system here. You have a lot of interconnected, simple systems and processes, individual cell behaviors that we discussed, communication between cells by chemical communication, mechanical communication, physics imp uh, imposed constraints like diffusion of growth factors or oxygen and glucose that are necessary for cell survival. And then of course you have at smaller scales at the intracellular scales, you have uh, cells that are sensing the environment and then making use of those signals in some way to make decisions. So you have uh, signaling you know, networks inside of individual cells that then go back up and connect to the cell behavioral characteristics of phenotype. And then you put these things together and you get systems of systems. The, the biggest example would be the immune system where you have you know, each individual immune cell type is, a, is its own system. It's a complex thing. And then you put an interacting network of different immune cell types together and you get a very complex uh, system. And in diseases, these systems can kind of fall out, fall out of balance and become dysregulated. And so treatments traditionally target parts of these systems. If you have cancer, you go and you get a chemotherapeutic agent and you cancer the, the rapidly growing cancer cells and hope to kill it off. Or say in an infection, you have an, a, a bacterial invader, so you find an antibiotic and you target it and that solves the problem. Well, the problem is that many complex systems, uh, like cancer, is a complex system. And so when you target just one small part of that system, you can have surprising effects that ripple through that nonlinear system. And that's where you get things like treatment side effects or treatment failure or um, destroying an organ in the process of curing your cancer. And so what we need to do is to understand diseases not as individual parts, but as a system. And so this is really where uh, multicellular systems biology comes in, is, is understanding not just you know, individual cell networks in their systems, but how the cells work together uh, to form or to break a tissue in, in, in disease form of well, working tissue that's in homeostasis uh, or in disease, how that breaks down. And of course, we're not just scientists at the end of the day, we're also trying to be clinicians and engineers. Systems biology wants to understand these multicellular systems and multicellular systems engineering wants to steer the behavior of these systems. And so an analogy I like to use, you know, for agent-based modeling in particular, is to think of multicellular biology as a play. And first you start off with the microenvironment, you know, the, the tissue, the chemical environment, and all the things in it, the, you know, extracellular matrix scaffolding is the stage. The cells are the actors that's, that are on that stage going through the play, and then they follow their own scripts. But like a good play, right, the, the script, the cells don't just you know, the actors don't just speak out to the audience, they speak to each other too. There's a dialogue, there's cell, cell communication. And then uh, of course, cancer and diseases are even more complicated. The actors can ad lib, they can change their own script, they can do mutations. Uh, they can tear up the stage like uh, extracellular matrix remodeling or, or neogenesis or changing of the of vascular networks. And so it's a really, really weird script and play. And as scientists and clinicians, we basically have an outside view inward. You go with experimental biology, so you can watch this play over and over and over again. You can start identifying the actors and identifying the stage, and by watching, you have hypotheses on the script saying, you know, when I see these two actors together, they do something, so I think that's their script. 
So it's our job as scientists to figure out each actor's script by watching this play over and over and over again. And then clinicians and engineers say, well, now that we know the script, can we rewrite the script, change the rules of the actors so they start behaving and forming an orderly system so the play goes back to the way we want it to be. And so agent-based modeling is one mod uh, paradigm for us to look at these complex multicellular systems. In this kind of a context, cells are software agents that move and live in a virtual tissue environment. And so we really want to keep that analogy of the play in mind. So to give us a little bit of background, just so that we have all the same language here, um, let's start about what is a discrete model. So discrete here uh, applies to discrete mathematics, that you have individual actors that take like Boolean or integer values. So in contrast to continuum mathematics. So a lot of us are already familiar with continuum models, where you have like a continuous variable that's often differentiable. And they can take continuous values, say, for example, any positive real number. A uh, classic example would be Fisher's equation. We model the density of cells, you know, number of cells per cubic micron, number of cells per some tiny, you know, volume. And you might model that as a combination of a diffusion process plus a logistic birth death process. And together, that will give you the movement of cells throughout the tissue. Well, that's a nice example. Uh, discrete models, again, are ones that take discrete individuals with discrete events. You have a birth event, a death event, a movement event. And those discrete variables will often take uh, generally Boolean or integer values. So not continuum values anymore, but a discrete number of, of possible states. Classic example, again, might say that you let X represent the number of cells in your population. So that's an integer variable and follow on a Poisson process where each individual cell has a probability or you know, say a, a birth rate of R. So between now T and the next type, step of time, delta t, t plus delta t, so there's a discrete time step, you have some probability of a birth event for each one of those individual cells, and each birth event would increase x by one. So there's a classic example of a discrete model. So agent-based modeling uh, is a very particular type of discrete model that simulates the individual cells and gives them a complex individual state. And so uh, here you're going to often combine then these discrete models with continuum models of the microenvironment to get a resulting hybrid discrete continuum model. So we have a discrete model of the cells, continuum uh, model of the microenvironment, say oxygen or glucose diffusion, and you put those together into a hybrid model. Now, agent-based modeling really is a classic place where uh, object-oriented programming is ideal because you can focus on the work of individual cells, you give each cell you know, its own independent data and have its own behavioral rules, and so you'll often define cells a class with member data and methods. And each cell, it would be then an instance of your cell class. Uh, and the agent-based models really are a nice way to get a little bit closer to the biology because you can focus on modeling individual cells and their changing behavior and really focus on translating what you see under the microscope. You know, this cell moves around, does this thing. And that becomes a matter of choosing the rules for your cell object. And you can tailor the level of detail to the problem that you're working on. You know, you can add molecular scale biology if you need it, or you can go back and make a very basic cell agent. So there's a lot of flexibility to tailor your approach to what you observe and what kinds of data you expect. So the typical program flow in an agent-based model really is, uh, you know, fairly universal. You're going to start with some setup steps. You're going to read the parameters. Then you're going to set up your stage, set up a microenvironment, create meshes, initialize your diffusing chemical substrates, diffusion solvers, whatever you need to do there. Then you're going to start uh, defining your actors. You're going to say, what are the cell types in my model? You're going to define all those cell types of different types of cells. And then you're going to instantiate those cells. You're going to place individual cells in the different types in your microenvironment. So now the stage is set. The players have entered the stage and can start the play. You start and you keep looping over time. Saying so between now, T, in a little tiny slice of time, T plus delta T in the future, you're going to go through and say, update my microenvironment. Go and do all your diffusion solvers, solve reaction diffusion equations using whatever methods you need, and then hold that tissue state frozen, and then update each individual cell state. Say, sample the microenvironment, run whatever modelings, you know, models we need to do for each individual cell, choose their updated behavior and characteristics and update them, and then uh, update their velocity, say, where are they moving, and then move the cells where they need to go. And that's it. Advance time and just keep going over and over and over again. Update the environment, update the cells, update the environment, update the cells until you're done. And so the play just keeps going and going and going. But the key thing about agent-based modeling is that because you have this step here where the cells are able to sample their environment and even act upon their environment, it becomes a very complex nonlinear system. And the cell behaviors really, the script really of the cells is incredibly dynamic as you go through the play of this multicellular system. So there are a, 
a lot of uh, cell-based modeling techniques, sometimes called individual-based models or cell-based models. Uh, we're just going to call them agent-based models. Uh, one of the big differentiating features is whether the cells are fixed to live on a lattice or if they're free to move anywhere in space. So lattice-based models would include things like cellular automaton models, where they can move left, right, up, or down on a very fixed mesh. Or if you want to zoom in a bit more and give more pixels per cell, that would be a cellular POTS model. And so uh, that's another great approach uh, for certain types of problems. Or you go off lattice, and that's actually where we'll be, uh, where you can model the cells as, say, acting under a balance of forces. Uh, you can model them as uh, very detailed, you know, multiple cell agents per cell, so you can kind of start modeling morphology, or you can kind of relax a bit and go back to say, you know, it's, it's one agent per cell, which is a bit more intuitive to start with. Uh, and then there are other methods uh, out there. I mean, the Chase framework, for example, does vertex and front tracking models, and those can be, uh, you know, a little bit slower to work with computationally, but they're, they're very powerful modeling techniques. And if you want to learn more, uh, we have a nice review article in a journal JCO Clinical Cancer Informatics. The hyperlink is right here on the screen, and I really do encourage you to, to, uh, to give that a look. So, um, so where does physical cell fit in? You know, we are an off lattice model, so the cells are not restricted to sitting on specific mesh points. Um, the spatial resolution of the agents, we have one agent per cell, so we're not going to model cell morphology, just the cell size and position. And there are some tricks, actually. You can use more agents to model cell parts if you want to and kind of fake this, a subcellular element model. Or you can even uh, model bigger agents to say, you know, that this is not really a cell anymore. It's just a piece of tissue. And so you can kind of uh, do some tricks with the agent modeling platform if you want to. And then we couple a physical cell with a, part, a PDE solver of the microenvironment to make it a discrete continuum approach, like we mentioned. So you solve PDEs for your microenvironment, discrete uh, cell events for the cells, and put them together, and you get this hybrid discrete continuum approach. So physical also can use ODEs and other uh, methods, such as uh, Boolean networks, uh, to model the dynamical details of individual cells. And so you can really come up with a very multi-scale model with this kind of framework. So to kind of give a little bit of an overview of the approaches that are married together in this modeling framework, uh, first thing we modeled uh, when we were building this was the microenvironment, because we knew we had to solve not just oxygen, not just glucose, not just a lactate, you know, not just a drug, but often all of these together, the cells have oxygen, glucose, uh, metabolites that come out as waste factors. They might have one or two signaling molecules, and then there might be a drug or two that you introduce into the system. Very quickly, you're talking about solving five to 10 partial differential equations. And so you need to be able to really solve vectors or bundles of, of diffusion equations at the same time. So we built BioFEM, which is a finite volume method, as a way to tackle this uh, efficiently in 2D and 3D on a desktop workstation. And uh, if you want to learn more about the technique, uh, it's available in bioinformatics. And this is actually bundled at kind of at the core of PhysiCell. Um, and it's parallelized to use multi, uh, multiple cores. So it's got OpenMP parallelization, scales linearly, you know, the number of substrates and the number of voxels that you expect, uh, and has a pretty good uh, numerical convergence, uh, second order in space, first order in time, if you want to know, and numerically stable. So that's the stage. Now let's talk about the afters. So we built it on top of that. Uh, BioFBM had uh, basically static agents that could sit there and secrete things into the environment or uptake them. So you could have them as, as static sources and sinks. Uh, Physis cell takes those static cell sources and sinks of substrates and adds the biology that each cell has its own position, its volume, its own phenotype and custom data. And in particular, then the methods that make this thing not just physics, but biology. So every cell has you know, a cell cycle process, death processes, uh, ways to change the secretion or sensing of the environment, uh, ways to do biased random migration so you have motility involved, uh, some basic mechanics based upon uh, uh, interaction potentials, kind of like molecular dynamics. And so uh, by adding these together, you can start you know, getting some complex systems. So as an example here on the right, showing this in, in 3D, uh, each one of these dots here is a cell uh, the little darker spots are the cell nuclei. So you can model the nuclei on the cytoplasm separately if you want to for your problem. And so in this particular problem, we have very, very simple rules. So first of all, I'm going to start with kind of, you know, have a kind of a chunk pulled out so you can see the interior dynamics of this tumor. And every cell is uh, initiated with one, uh, one variable for basically aggressiveness as, as a heterogeneous variable. So every cell, this kind of shows the idea of where uh, an agent-based modeling approach lets you uh, really model the heterogeneity of cancer. And so here, every cell agent has a level of aggressiveness from zero to large. So blue cells are not very aggressive. So they basically proliferate very slowly. Yellow cells are the most aggressive cells. They, aggress they can proliferate very quickly. 
Every cell as a proxy of energy requires oxygen to progress in its cell cycle. So the more oxygen the cell has, the faster it can go through the cycle uh, proportionally to its level of progressiveness. And now and this is a hybrid discrete continuum, right? So we talked a little bit about the cell roles, but also we have oxygen diffusion. So there's an oxygen boundary condition on the outer edge of this domain. Oxygen diffuses in, is consumed by the tumor cells, which means that you have a drop in oxygen levels you get into the inside of this tumor interior. So as oxygen gets lower and lower and lower, the cell cycling slows down because they have less oxygen available and therefore less energy until you get to the very center of the tumor and oxygen is too low for cell survival and they go into a form of death called necrosis. So watch for brown cells to emerge. And so this model here has an initial heterogeneity, you know, heterogeneous distribution, kind of the salt and pepper distribution of the tumor cell aggressiveness, but no mutations. So it's basically just a selection process. So watch as this thing goes, you see that the yellow patches, you know, grow more rapidly as you would expect, and the blue patches a little bit less. Uh, and here you can see the first instances of necrosis popping up in the center of this tumor spheroid. And then here, because of the, uh, the combined effects of mechanics, the necrotic cells are shrinking, but still sticking together, that's mechanically unstable. And you can see this kind of a network of you know, fluid-filled chasms really emerging in the center of this dead tumor. And so this is just one example that's actually bundled in every physicist cell download. And so you can play with it later on. And if you click on this hyperlink, uh, while you're learning to, phys uh, to build physicist cell models yourself, you can try an online version of it uh, without compiling or downloading anything. And if you want to read more about the, the method of this uh, framework, you can go to Plus Computational Biology, where we publish the method paper at the hyperlink here in this in the slides. So, you know, kind of delving into the, an overview of what physicist cell is and what we're going to learn over the next few days of sessions, uh, we model the microenvironment as a stage using BioFEM for the, uh, as a finite volume solver for diffusion, uh, decay, uptake, and secretion of these different substrates. And the nice thing about it is now you can define and set up this diffusion completely within the XML configuration file. We'll learn more about that in the next couple of days. Um, the next thing you define is cell definition. So this would be kind of like a virtual cell line, you know, MD, uh, MD, MD-231 breast cancer cells, for example, or fibroblasts or immune cells or CD8 T cells. That you can model, uh, define in XML, a handful of cell definitions that give you the default phenotype for the behavioral parameters for that individual cell type. And then you have the cell agents, which are basically instances of different cell definitions. And here you can say, you initialize them, say, where are they? They will go and grab the initial properties and conditions out of the cell definition. And then you can start modifying them with your own script by making functions that vary the cell phenotypes. Say, you know, in this condition, how do I change a cell cycle parameter? How do I change, uh, say, the secretion rate or the uptake rate? Do I turn something on or off? Do you turn motility on or off? And so by varying the phenotype of the conditions through functions, you can yourself write the script that models your hypotheses of how those cells behave. Then on top of that, to help facilitate that, you can give every individual cell its own custom variables and custom data uh, that you can read and write to to help you as you write your custom cell rules. So that's going to be kind of uh, something we'll be learning as we go through. Uh, so uh, one more thing, you know, just a note about the time steps. The physicist cell you know, has multiple time steps to help kind of facilitate things, realizing that all the processes that happen in a model happen at different time scales. Uh, chemical transport is a really fast process. It's probably the fastest, in fact, it is the fastest process in our simulation. And so we have a delta T diffusion, which we default to 0 0.01 minutes after a whole lot of testing for things that look like oxygen or drugs. Uh, as a default. So that's like the fastest time step. So every tick, tick, tick in the simulation is one diffusion time step. And then with the next fastest process is cell mechanics, you know, cells pushing each other around, crawling around in a tissue, sticking to one another. And so that's a relatively fast process, but nowhere close, near as close as fast as uh, chemical diffusion. And so we give that a time step size of 0 0.1 minutes to, to help resolve the approximately one minute time scale cell movement. And then cell uh, phenotype, like say, changing volume, growing, progressing through cell cycle, those happen on the order of, you know, say a 30 minute to an hours or hours long time scales. And so we pick a step size of six minutes for a delta T cell. And so what this allows you to do is get a little bit more efficiency in the simulation platform because we don't necessarily have to run everything at every single uh, diffusion time step. So let's kind of go through some recent examples of physicist cell in motion. Um, first example is, uh, work led by a graduate student in my lab who will be uh, graduating very soon named Yao Fen Wang. 
And he did some really nice work on modeling the mechanical interactions between the tumor and the parenchyma, that is the normal tissue and liver surrounding a micrometastasis. And uh, you can get this work as open source at scientific reports at the hyperlink here in the PowerPoint slides. Uh, the question really we set out to ask here is, you know, suppose you have a tumor cell that arrives in a distant organ, say the liver in, in this case, a uh, colorectal cancer cell. And, you know, somehow that tumor cell needs to interact mechanically with the tissue around it and make some space for its own expansion. And so we built a, a model with some very basic biomechanical tumor parenchyma feedback. But first of all, the parenchyma can press on the tumor and cause a mechanical pressure. And one thing we do know is that when cells get very, very compressed, they can downregulate their cell proliferations, like a size, uh, it's like a volume exclusion principle. Then on the flip side, though, the tumor is also imparting mechanical forces on the parenchyma, the tissue around it. And so we used a very basic plastic elastic model to help model this. That on short time scales, you know, the parenchyma is kind of all attached together and anchored to positions on the extracellular matrix. And so if you push a little bit of parenchyma away, it's going to be elastic restorative force to try to bring it back to its resting configuration. And so that, you know, pushback, that elastic pushback is what's allowing the parenchyma to impart a mechanical pressure on the tumor. But, you know, if you leave a, tumor, a, a tissue deformed long enough or displaced long enough, uh, there's a plastic reorganization that eventually the rest position of that agent will go and, uh, and kind of converge towards the cell's current position so that you get a new resting configuration. So over short times, the tissue pushes back, but over a long time, if you keep the push tissue stretched long enough, it eventually kind of, um, uh, kind of gives up and, and reorganizes itself. And then also we've just hypothesized a very simple model that uh, normal tissue can only tolerate so much deformation. And so if, uh, basically if a tumor managed to deform a tissue fast enough, uh, then we modeled that as saying that it would, that would kill off that little bit of liver tissue and make some space for growth. And so it's a competition of all these processes. So as an example here, you can see a large chunk of liver tissue and the yellow cells are the tumor cells that have experienced a high pressure and are shutting down the proliferation. On the other hand, as the tumor gets bigger, it starts getting a dead center, and that will cause a, a relief of that mechanical pressure. I don't know why this is coming up uh, corrupted here, unfortunately. Um, let's try this again. This will play the growth. Yeah, I don't know why that's not playing. Well, you'll have to take my word for it here. We'll play it maybe during the workshop. If you take a cross section, though, you can see that the uh, the pressure is greatest just a little bit behind the edge of uh, the interface between the tumor and the surrounding tissue, uh, and then kind of relaxes towards the necrotic core. So you kind of get this yellow ring here around the edge of the tumor, uh, where it's got the lowest proliferate, uh, the highest pressure, and therefore it starts slowing down the proliferation. Then if you look outside the tumor into the, into the tissue, you can see that the highest deformation and stresses really are right there at the very edge of the tumor, um, and at the, the interface between the tumor and the normal tissue, and then it kind of dissipates it propagates and dissipates into the tissue. And if we look at clinical samples and kind of zoom in around that interface, first of all, you see the necrotic core like you'd expect, but more importantly here, you can see where the, the liver tissue is actually parallel to the interface, which means that it's been squished and compressed and stretched to kind of go parallel to that growing tumor interface, just like we saw in the simulations. And the effect is most pronounced right up here at the edge where you have the most compression, the most elongation. So that matches the predictions pretty nicely. One thing that's kind of cool is that there are certain parameter regimes where uh, basically the, the balance between uh, elastic force pushing back on the tumor and the tumor pressure, and then that the plastic reorganization is slow enough uh, that actually you can get enough pressure to arrest the growth of the tumor. So you can actually kind of cause a dormant state just fully, just by these very basic mechanical processes. And so if you have the right combination of parameters, there's some tissues where a tumor seeding in just can't grow beyond a certain size and then will just arrest. So that's kind of a fascinating thing to come out of this very basic model. So you can get tumor dormancy under this kind of a basic mechanical biologic feedback system. Then uh, on the flip side, you can actually cause, uh, take a look saying what happens in order to change for some reason, say illness uh, or you know, a new infection or an injury, but if something changes the mechanical properties of the surrounding tissue to either reduce its elasticity or to reduce its tolerance for damage, then you can get a previously tu dormant tumor can just take off and start growing again. So you get this basically be tumor reawakening. So the neat thing that you can see is that, you know, this kind of a balance is fairly delicate and it, it can last for a long, long time. Uh, but if there are changes in your tissue, you can get a previously dormant tumor to awaken, you know, perhaps months or years after it had rested.
So uh, another example that we have is some of our tumor immune modeling, which maybe some of you have already seen. Uh, so it won't take it too long, but if you take that heterogeneous tumor and now add on some red immune cells and say that they migrate through the tissue by chemical chemotaxis, they're looking for factor, say inflammatory factors uh, secreted by tumor cells. And then they test for mechanical contact. And when they come in contact, form an adhesion. And then those immune cells are gonna sample the immunogenicity of the cancer. So the easiest the way we model that, say that the more yellow the cell is, the more uh, aggressive it is, we're gonna say that it's probably got more mutations and it stands out as a bit more immunogenic to that tumor cell. And so, that, sorry, to that immune cell. So the red immune cell will have a greater probability of killing off a yellow cell than a blue cell. And so what we're gonna model this as a kind of a discrete process that uh, in any little chunk of time, T to T plus delta T, uh, there's gonna be some probability, basically there's a killing rate times you know, the immunogenicity times the delta T to give you a probability of, kill, of that immune cell killing off the attached tumor cell in that little chunk of time. If it succeeds, great. And then it starts, that initiates, kind of triggers a death process in the tumor cell, detaches, and then continues its search for another target. But if it fails, it's gonna keep staying adhered and trying over and over and over again. And so we add one more variable that says, what's my mean attachment time for that immune cell? And in any time, uh, again, from T to T plus delta T, but discrete probability, say that my delta T divided by my mean lifetime is my probability of detaching this little tiny chunk of delta T. So you get this kind of trade-off in behaviors. So you put these very basic model rules together of, of just cell contact. Um, and you get, first of all, you know, what you initially what you expect, right? The immune cells are coming in, they're, they're attacking, attaching themselves to tumor cells. Uh, they're successfully killing off a lot of them, particularly the yellow cells, but you know, also the blue cells are slightly immunogenic. And then they kind of keep marching their way up the chemical gradient uh, to, to keep marching into the core of the tumor. But you know, this is a stochastic event. They're running, running around, you know, migrating randomly through this uh, tissue and they don't get every single tumor cell. So they kill off a lot of blue cells. They kill off even more yellow cells, but in particular, they have cleared out a lot of space and they didn't kill every single yellow cell. So what happens now is that they've actually cleared out a lot of space and a lot of competition. And the yellow cells, uh, while well, the immune cells are kind of confused and clumped up at this chemical maximum, uh, can start repopulating the tumor. So uh, they can actually repopulate this. So this is a case where, you know, and well-mixed ODE model probably would have predicted that you just kill off the yellow cells and you're done. But when you add space and stochasticity, you start getting interesting emergent effects. And you can try this model yourself at this NanoHub model that's on the screen here. Uh, we also did some work with Argonne National Lab just to say, well, how about uh, now we ramp this up and say, well, one simulation is nice, but it's basically a demo. So we picked three parameter values of low, medium, and high values. So that's three to the third or 27 parameter sets. It's a stochastic model. So you better run multiple replicates per parameter set. So that's 270 simulation runs. And at the time we wrote the model, it took about a weekend to run this on a desktop computer. So that's a year and a half of continuous computing. And it's just not feasible. And so we worked with Argonne National Lab to do this as a high throughput computing example, where they just took all 270 simulations and ran them simultaneously on a Cray. And we found that uh, this, this model investigation of a highly nonlinear model uh, gave us surprises. In particular, looking at the randomness of immune cell migration turned out to be a lot more interesting than we expected. That, you know, in our initial value, it's just kind of saying that they're kind of having, you know, somewhat random and somewhat different, it's kind of in the middle ground there, that turned out to be like the optimally bad uh, setup for your immune cell behavior. It turns out the cells had been more random, they'd be more random mixing like an ODE model, and they do a much better job of killing off a bunch of cancer cells. Or if they were more deterministic, it was also better because then they would just go straight from target to target to target to target to target and have no problems finding things to kill. So it was really fascinating. It turned out that kind of a, a quasi uh, random quasi deterministic cell migration was actually one of the worst possible uh, you know, strategies for these immune cells in this particular model. And so we've also said, you know, what happens if you increase the number of parameters you explore? So go up from uh, three parameters to six parameters. That's a six dimensional design space. And it gets really, really tricky to do brute force investigation like our, our last one. So you reformulate the problem as a, a series of, of, of de design decisions, basically say, you know, what does it take to, uh, to uh, to reach cancer control, where the number of final cells doesn't exceed the initial cells. Well, that's basically a binary classification problem. There are sets in your parameter space that meet your design goal. There are points in your parameter space that don't meet your design goal. And so if you do this, you can use an active learning process where you build your binary classifier uh, by first just picking random points in your parameter space and classifying them for all your stochastic runs. 
And then you choose your next set of simulations, you know, basically parameter sets to help you resolve the decision boundary. And then you can use the Gini coefficients to help you understand the importance of the parameters in finding that decision boundary. And so by putting together high performance computing and active learning and a mechanistic model, you're able to get some really nice science here. So here's just an example of the broad variety of, of outcomes of this model, depending upon your parameters. And the neat thing is that uh, based upon this, this combined learning system, we were able to learn quite a bit about the underlying biology. And it found out that the most important parameter was just uh, how long the cell, these immune cells go on and how many times they can kill before they wear out. And that is very much related to T cell exhaustion. So that was actually quite interesting. That came out purely out of contact interactions and no signaling dynamics whatsoever. Uh, another example is our more recent work uh, led by our postdoc Michael Getz to develop uh, SARS-CoV-2 tissue simulators. And so uh, this is a community driven work and uh, a lot of you are involved with this. So we're very excited for that. Uh, but the idea is to take a collaborative iterative approach to doing team science here where we, we you know, together bring together experts from a broad variety of fields. We build you know, a tissue simulator that's built up uh, in a modular way and then different teams work on different aspects of the project. And we work our way through modularly. So we're actually in phase two of the project right now where phase one, we kind of built the team that brought everyone together Phase two, is, which we're in right now, has been very community driven. And we've been iteratively adding more and more features to this uh, multi-scale simulator of, of a virus replicating in tissue and spreading outward and then the immune response uh, and building that up until we get something that we think is realistic enough to start doing virtual experiments on. And so uh, here really, we don't have much time. I don't want to really dwell too much upon this, but the idea is that, you know, that we start with an early prototype and here, the more yellow the cell is, the more infected it is. And you can see how it kind of starts off at ground zero and expands outward into the tissue. And then these black cells are the dead cells. And so prototype got that first effect. Second prototype added more realistic uh, seeding conditions for the virus. So they have little tiny foci of infection all over the place and more realistic uh, replication dynamics and uh, receptor dynamics because the virus has to bind to a receptor before it comes into a cell. Uh, the third model got really interesting because we had a lot of wonderful collaborators help to bring in some of the uh, the immunology now. So we had you know macrophages chasing around looking for dead cells, activating, and then secreting the really stimulating inflammation that would start recruiting in neutrophils and uh, then of course uh, cytotoxic T cells, CD8 positive T cells or effector cells that would come in and start munching on infected cells. In the more recent model. Uh, we started adding lymph node components. So you can actually have an agent-based model like this connected to kind of an off-screen ODE model, lymph nodes, and have cells trafficking back and forth between the screen that you see and the ODE, the lymph node model that's off the screen that you don't see. And so, uh, and we added things like uh, interferon signaling and saw that we uh, started getting a little more realistic dynamics again, that you know, in reality, for most people, you do recover from your infection. Whereas in our earlier models, the immune system doesn't quite intact enough to actually fight off the infection. So you start adding on interferons and can actually drastically slow down the infection. Now in more recent work, we've been adding fibrosis and tissue damage and healing. And now uh, finally adding you know, the, uh, the, the neutralizing antibodies and the negative feedbacks and some of the bystander effects. So we like, for example, neutrophils can secrete reactive oxygen species that kill off and cause collateral damage to nearby cells. Um, just as one last example to kind of show the types of models that you can build in Physicel, I'd like to point out some recent work by our postdoc, Avril uh, Rocha, uh, jointly with Johns Hopkins and Inesh over there in particular. Uh, this is work has been recently accepted into iScience and you can get the preprint on BioArchive while we're going through the publication process. Uh, but the idea is that if you look into most tumors, they're hypoxic, right? You know, they, they grow, they outstrip the blood supply and the farther and farther you get from a blood vessel, uh, first, you get low oxygen and when hypoxia, we can, you can drastically change cell behavior. And then if you get too far away, you'll get necrotic regions. So you can see this in the mouse models. This is data from, uh, from Daniel Gilkes' lab over at Johns Hopkins. And she and her lab developed this really awesome uh, way of marking tumor cells to say, you know, we want to understand who's hypoxic and not just who's hypoxic now, but who has ever been hypoxic, which is something we've never been able to track before. It's been like the dream data for us as modelers. So she made this really, really cool fate mapping system where the tumor cells initially are red fluorescent. And then as they get exposed to hypoxic conditions, they basically do their own gene editing. They snip out the red fluorescent gene and that then allows them to express a green fluorescent gene and permanently change color to green. So red cells uh, have never been hypoxic. Green cells either are or have been hypoxic. You get basically a nice visual data recorder of who's doing what. 
And so you can kind of look across the zones of the tumor, see that the outer edge is closest to oxygen sources is still red. Then you kind of have an intermediate green region, and then you have hypoxic stuff and a dead core in the very center that's uh, just full of dead gunk. And so well, one question is, you know, if you have a cell that is reactive to hypoxic conditions and changed its rules. Uh, so one thing that hypoxic cells will often do is that they'll, they'll cycle their, their uh, proliferation a little bit slower and then ramp up their motility because they're basically trying to flee those stressful bad conditions and find regions of higher oxygen. And so that's one of the, the major responses of a hypoxic cell. So the question that we often, you know, we actually asked a lot of biologists this several years ago is saying, you know, take the hypoxia adapted cells. Now it's wandering around, it's migrating and it flees low oxygen regions and gets back to region of high oxygen. What does it do? Does it keep its new hypoxic phenotype forever? Does it keep it for some time and then revert back to its old normoxic behavior? You know, what, what, what happens here? And when I asked actually a whole bunch of biologists at the conference, I got the answers that ranged from zero to infinity of how long the cells will retain their old hypox their, their new hypoxic phenotype and the time it takes for them to revert to their old behavior. So basically I asked a question, you know, survey a room of biologists and you get the entire right half line of the real line. And they're probably all right. And so we built a comp basic computational model in physicist cell where we modeled this, uh, this gene process here where when cells are exposed to hypoxia, they gradually change color. We modeled a, a, a very basic model of HIF1 alpha in the cells and had that change the gene expression in the cells so they can change the fluorescent color as a really basic model. And then we added a, a, a persistence time variable that said basically, oh, sorry, so this is the model of the gene changes here. And then we had oxygen dependence for cell proliferation and also pressure dependence and then uh, bias random migration of oxygen gradients. Uh, and then uh, my postdoc did a really, really wonderful job of matching the cell motility to experimental values and found that there were some differences between green cell and red cell motility, uh, particularly in their biases. Um, and so then the last thing we did was we added a, a persistence variable to each individual cell saying, what is the mean time that that cell retains an invasive migratory phenotype after it's left low oxygen regions. And so the first thing we did is say, you know, first of all, let's just assume it's, that it's zero. We you know that a lot of classical mathematical models would just basically say that you use oxygen as a proxy. Let's say if you're in low oxygen levels, you have high motility. If you're in high oxygen levels, you have no motility. And you just kind of do it as a discrete, you know, as a, a sharp switch in based upon oxygen levels. That basically corresponds to zero persistence time in, in the cell migration phenotype. And when we modeled that, we actually were quite surprised, but maybe we shouldn't have been, that uh, the cells basically just migrate right up to the edge of low oxygen and then just stop. And so then the tumor might grow a little bit bigger and then that, the, the boundary of low oxygen moves. So they move a little bit more, but basically they just keep pace with, uh, with the perinecrotic boundary. So you end up with this well-defined ring structure, this angular structure of a red zone of, of plenty of oxygenation Kind of an orange transition zone where the cells are both red and, and green fluorescent because they're kind of switching and then green cells pushing behind but the green cells never had any reason to push any farther because they escaped the hypoxic zone and they were happy so under those assumptions of no phenotypic persistence you have no invasion but now if you give the cells a, a biased migration of the oxygen gradients and if you turn on a persistence time that's greater than zero, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be very big. You get something that's quite different. Now the green cells can stochastically punch their way through that red material and escape the tumor. And then you've opened up a mechanical weakness and a bunch of other green cells can follow along. And that's another cool thing about agent-based modeling. You say, how simple of a rule can I get away with to get something that matches something I see experimentally? In particular, do you need to, to get something that looks like collective cell migration, do you actually need the cells to communicate and work together? Or can it be something where they're all independent working uh, for their own good, but they all find the same mechanical weakness? And so it looks like collective migration, but there's nothing collective about it. And that's actually something we found. So here we see a simulation. Uh, we see the red region, you see the motile cells, and they got the phenotypic persistence, and they're kind of burrowing through that uh, red material if you zoom in really close, you can see kind of these trails, these what we call hypoxic plumes, these plumes of green cells that kind of float up through the red material until they escape into the surrounding tissue. And so this just came out as a natural consequence of the model. And we had not yet seen it in the data, but when we took it back to our collaborators, we were really excited and they were excited to say, hey, we've seen these. We've seen these in our mice. 
And we didn't have an explanation before, but it looked like collective migration, but we actually were able to find that cells working completely independently of one another were able to create these apparently collective structures because of the stochasticity and the mechanical weaknesses in the tissue. That once one green cell finds a path, it opens up a little highway for other cells to follow behind and squeeze in because it's mechanically favorable. And an agent-based model gives you uh, uh, basically a way to explain what you see. So here's kind of a cool thing where you have experiments and models working together. A new experimental technology allows you to see something for the first time. For example, see the green plumes. No one had seen those before because you couldn't image it. Uh, and then a mathematical model lets you say, what rules does it take to explain the structures that we now can see for the first time? So you can get a way of uh, come up with hypotheses to explain the things that you see you know, for the first time with your novel experimental technologies. And that, that kind of marriage between mathematics and cutting edge experimental biology is a really, really cool thing. And that, that's very amenable to agent-based modeling. Uh, we'd like to point out that the hypotheses worked in 3D as well as in 2D. So if you model like say a, a core section of a 3D tumor, you see you know, necrotic core forming, you can see the formation of these plumes that go out. And that the bigger the tumor it is, the more it looks like the 2D situation starts to match a little bit better. So I'd like to thank you very much for following along here in this talk today and looking at an introduction to agent-based modeling. Uh, the basic ideas behind Physicel as an agent-based modeling platform, and a few examples of uh, Physicel applied to cancer biology problems. So I look forward to continuing with you in the next several sessions as we get to learn the system and as you start on your own hackathon projects. So I hope you really enjoy your time here.